my name is Tom. I am 42 years old and my current pursuits are becoming qualified as a counsellor as well as volunteering my time to both Bath Hospital Radio as a presenter and to Bath Mind as an office administrator. On top of that, I record a daily podcast. I'm a musician, an illustrator and a collector of hobbies. My first recollections of a mental health episode probably go back to when I was about four years old. I recall everybody's heads inflating like balloons around the dinner table. And it's because it was not uncommon for my dad to lash out if there was anything that he seemed like unhappy with, whether that be not eating a certain thing or the way that we were eating. And this uh, created this anxiety that made me hyper aware to the point where I was focusing so much on any kind of uh, micro expression or indicator that there was going to be an incident that I would develop this defense mechanism. And this continued on to, you know, just then anywhere in any situation, I would get extremely hot. I would panic. I would uh, hear voices and see things. And this has carried on with me to today. I wouldn't say that I was ever clear of it. The symptoms that I have as part of my disorder are continuous. The thing is, you, you get to the point where you're so used to it that you forget that it's there. It's like having tinnitus. You can hear this high pitch whine in your ear to the point where you just get so used to it, you forget for a minute that it's there. And then you remember and then it comes back. Aside from that, it does come in waves. So the intensity can die down. And then other days, it's insurmountable. Panic and fear. One of the worst things that you can do is try and intellectualize it and make sense of what's going on because that's a lost cause learned from experience that sometimes the best thing to do is batten down the hatches and ride it out. If I can lock myself into something like, you know, anything that's on the TV or a video game, let everybody know that I have responsibilities to, that today is not my day, and release myself from those responsibilities and those pressures. That gives me the room to breathe, to take a minute. I think one of the main things that really sparks off my anxiety is knowing that I have some responsibility in the future and I stew about that. So having those gone and letting myself know that it's okay, that this is part of an illness and that to cope with that illness, it's all right to rest, to be inactive. The other thing I do is make lists. If I feel completely devastated that I'm not getting on with things, I have whiteboards around the house and I just write little lists that say, okay, maybe tomorrow we'll try just doing this simple task. And if I can tick that off, then I can get into bed and I won't lie awake at night thinking I did nothing. At least I made a list. That's a baby step in the direction of being productive and useful. And knowing that you're productive and useful is the antithesis of sinking into that quicksand of feeling like a loser. If you'd never experienced something like this before in your life, and then suddenly you had those screaming, belittling, berating voices, just taking away any confidence that you had that you could overcome these feelings, and the feelings themselves are hitting you like a wave of desperation, then you would definitely think that there was a serious problem here. But if you've lived with it, like many people do, it's such a part of your life that you accept it. It also does something else, which is kind of unique. It gives you a level of empathy that I think stands above those that don't have a condition where they're constantly emotionally tested. People who have this, even those who seem fragile, I assure you, they are forged in the fire of being emotionally bombarded. And it means that they're aware of the emotions of others around them. And that sense of other people being feeling humans 
rather than obstacles is a wonderful thing to have. It's a gift. Would I trade it? Probably, yes. <laughs> uh, but seeing as I can't, I'll take it. So the dream that I would have as a child that recurred constantly, almost every night, was that of being at the top of a very tall bell tower with a rickety wooden staircase that spiralled all the way down to the ground. And at the top of this stairwell waited a wolf, a werewolf, if you will, that was made out of a patchwork quilt. Which doesn't sound very terrifying, but maybe it's the lighting or, uh, or just because I was, you know, very young that this uh, towering quilt werewolf had it in for me. And we would start almost together at the top of this bell tower and I knew that it wanted blood, it wanted me and I would run and I would run and I would run all the way down to the bottom and it almost got me several times and I would finally get to the bottom and there was a doorway and standing in the doorway was a beef eater, the type you might find at Buckingham Palace. And he would say, get behind me. And he would shoo away the wolf and the wolf would look very dejected and disappointed. And it would start going back up the bell tower and I was safe. And that was the end of the dream. And that would continue on and on. And I would wake up screaming, terrified. I finally got used to the dream. And I knew that the beef eater was always there and he would always protect me. So it was kind of going through the motions. But then one day I got to the bottom and the beef eater said, no, I'm not helping you this time. Panic set in. My heart sank into my stomach and I knew that I was done for because this is where I escape from the wolf. And the wolf called up to me and then just stood next to me like it didn't know what to do. And I didn't know what to do. So we just stood there, and that was the end of the dream. The following night, sure enough, there I was in the bell tower, stood next to the wolf. But I didn't run, I wasn't afraid. And we walked down the stairs together. And the beef eater wasn't there, and at the bottom of the stairs, the dream dissipated, and that was the last time I ever visited the clock tower, and the last time that I ever met the wolf. I was aware of the challenges that I was facing with my mental health, even at a young age. And I tried to voice these out to anyone who would listen. I took a letter begging for help to the headmaster of my school. And he ripped up that letter and threw it in the bin and told me to get lost. So that was the kind of struggle I was up against in getting anyone else to understand what was going on. This wolf was chasing me down. And then I realized, and perhaps the dream is the uh, embodiment of this, that the real challenge was to accept that this was a part of who I was. The wolf was inside me. I was the wolf. I needed to accept that and integrate and understand that in order to move forward, we needed to come to some agreement that we were both living in the same vessel. And once that acceptance had started to occur, as young as I was, then I learned to start developing mechanisms that allowed me to achieve my goals despite these emerging mental health difficulties. I went on to try and do a degree, and I got so much help and so much support that it completely turned everything around. You know, suddenly I started getting explanations for things that had bothered me all of my life. I had resources at my fingertips to start putting into place mechanisms that allowed me to succeed where I had failed all my life. Things like getting a driver's license. I never thought that was possible. I just didn't think that I was able to do that, but I got one of those. I passed my degree. And these levels of success that I never knew before all came from the kind of support that I got from the education system. Not medicine, not doctors, not the NHS. I get that support now, but only by having other people with me who helped me batter the door in and get inside. So I didn't get support for my mental health until I was nearing my mid-30s. And my life has been a hell of a lot better since. And I've achieved things in my life that I never thought I was able to achieve. But the heartbreaking thing is I could have achieved those things back in my early 20s, in my teens. And now I'm living with 
coping mechanisms that I've designed for myself out of desperation that are now ingrained inside me, some of which are probably not as effective as if I would received help back when I needed it. Time is the true currency, and to be shortchanged is tragic. It's one thing to lose something that you hold dear, but it can be replaced, perhaps. You lose a love in your life, and another love will come to you. But time on this planet, time to enjoy all of the things that you hope and dream of, and then to be presented with the fact that those hopes and dreams are gone. Your chance to achieve has been taken from you. Heartbreaking. Your shot, if you had one, has not materialized, and it's because you were too busy fighting against life on hard mode with one hand tied behind your back, trying to survive. Out of context, Morgan Freeman, in an interview about finding your place and striving to become a better person, he said simply, The train leaves every day. And don't worry about the destination because nearly every time that you pick a destination and that's where you want to be, halfway through, you're going to meet at least one crossroads where you're going to be offered an opportunity or you're going to see that perhaps there's something that's even more worthy of your energy. So with that in mind, yes, maybe I could cry into a pillow and say, oh, what about the last decade? I wish I could have that back. What cool stuff I could do. Well, what about the next decade? Let's talk about what we can do with what's in front of us. Why not? And see where it leads us. So with that in mind, I've always chased personal ambitions, being an actor, being a rock star, being a nice hockey player. But the one thing that I never thought really interested me academically, which is no matter how tired I am, no matter how inside my own thoughts with my own craziness, if someone comes to me asking for help, I completely switch. I go into help mode and it starts to clear the cobwebs of my own mind. Helping others helps me. I don't know if that makes it a selfish act, but I absolutely love it. And I love the dialogue and I love what I learn from that dialogue. I did the Children and Young People's Mental Health Awareness Level 2 online and started to see all of these things like, oh my God, that was me. And this is how I could have helped me if I'd gone back in time and found me and helped me. This is how it would have been done. And suddenly some lights started turning on and I started to see things in my past that now had context, which then led me on to doing the counselling course that connection with other people's pain and that feeling of being lost is something that I know so intimately that I interface with that straight away. And that's almost a non-vocal thing. You instinctively know when someone has been through what you've been through. You're talking to a survivor here, so it's okay. A percentage of the kids in each classroom are kids that are going to have some level of mental illness. It could be something where they're under some amount of strain or trauma and that can grow. What you've got there is the seed. If you're open to identifying that seed, then you can stop it from growing into something that's going to ruin their lives. All problem behavior stems from a desire to communicate something. So if you can look past the fact that they're being annoying and they're throwing paint pots on the ground and causing a mess, get down to it. Why are they doing it? And that's what inspires me. I want to help kids to not be lost, to fulfill their potential as they see fit, give them hope. And if I got educated enough to really have some strong opinions, be a part of making some changes. That would be cool. I'm kind of excited.